what your grace and mercy said. Oh no, oh no, oh no. You've already paid the price. Mm -hmm. I thank you. Mm -hmm. I thank you. because of your grace oh your grace mm, yeah it brought, it brought me through oh oh your grace Your grace, it brought me, brought me through. Mm, I'm living each moment. I'm living this moment. It was all because, all because. And I'm always going to thank you. And I'm always going to thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm going to praise you. It was your grace. Your grace. Your grace. Oh, it was your Your grace that brought me through. Your grace, thank you, Lord. Your grace. You woke me up this morning, started me on my way. Your grace. And I want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Food on my table. Lord, you're able. You woke me up, started me on my way. Oh, Lord, he
This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. Let us be glad. Let us be glad in it. Uh -huh. And rejoice therein. Yeah. Why should I be glad in it? He woke my wife and up early this morning uh -huh. and prepared us to come to church so we could meet you. That's one reason I'm glad in it. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. You know, the Lord has ways of working things out. Oh, yes, he does. Now, my wife told me, said, now, don't you be too long, Wilbur, because I know how you talk. <laughs> but it's just sometimes things come up that you have to mention. Now, Brother, Brother Gray asked me about two weeks ago, well, first of all, let me say that Brother Gray is our uh, veterans chairman. And we know very little about Brother Gray. Deacon Gray. Deacon Gray is employed by the VA administration in the city of St. Louis. Amen. Now, in addition to that, when he was a very young man, he joined the Navy. He was in the Navy for a few years, and I don't know how long. But after he got out of the Navy and things took place, he joined the Army. And he went from private all the way up to Lieutenant Colonel. What you say? Amen. All Brother right. Gray has 
very little to say, himself, to say about itself, so we don't know too much. But uh, I did get that information. And as I was saying that the Lord has ways of working things out, when Brother Gray mentioned to me, I don't know if he knew that his family would be here today and we would kind of highlight him in addition to his family. So that's just something I wanted to mention. I would like for all the veterans, if you will, please come up and stand by me. All the veterans. Come on up. All the veterans. Uh, uh, bring, bring Brother uh, Harrison up, somebody. Uh, Brother Harrison. And uh, the other gentleman there that I talked to last week, sitting over there with the gray suit on. I, I want you to come up. Uh, yes, bring him up, bring him up. Brother Harrison, we got anybody in the pulpit that, that's a uh, veteran? If you are, we'd like you just to come up so we can give you the honor that you deserve. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, uh, if you will, please, uh, don't block the pastor's view. Come over on this side. No, 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 no. Come over, here, gentlemen. <laughs> Come over this way. Gentlemen and ladies, I'm sorry. Uh. Now, gentlemen and ladies and church family, I would like to present to you our veterans of Pleasant Green Baptist Church. Now, while you are standing, ladies and gentlemen, what I would like for you to do is to say this. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. And I will say amen. Amen. Now you can go back and have your seats. Thank you for coming. Now in addition, uh, not least, but in addition to what we've already done, I would like to say that uh, during the week, there was uh, news on our TV, and I saw it three times. It was a gentleman by the name of Reverend Hardy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I learned this morning who Reverend Hardy is. He received uh, citations and uh, uh, I think it was a blue, a blue ribbon, and it was presented to him uh, in honor of his service that he did while he was in the war, and it was real, it was a, a few years late coming to him. But Reverend Hardy, that was on TV, is... <laughs> Reverend Hardy, that was on TV is our own Reverend Harding's father. Oh, amen. And I told him this morning after I picked up that invitation, I told Reverend Harding, Reverend Harding. that uh, con I would like to congratulate him and his family. Amen. In amen. The veterans day here at Pleasant Green. So I just want to thank everyone for uh, giving me this time so we could honor our veterans. Thank you very much, and may God bless you all. Anyway, I just want to uh, 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 wear it so that you can see, and uh, I did have the honor when I was in the Navy uh, to be in Pearl Harbor. Uh, USS Arizona is sunk out there. It was. Uh, uh, bombed by the Japanese, and while I was in the Navy, I did have the honor to observe. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you very much. Indeed, we uh, 
we are thankful for all of the service that has been given by men and women uh, in all the uh, wars that uh, our country has been in, the sacrifices they have made, and the ones that did not come back home, we remember them and we honor them. I saw um, my wife last night, we watched the news, we saw this Reverend Harding, and my wife, she hollered, and she said, come here, is this our Reverend Harding? And I looked, I said, no, that's, that's not our Reverend Harding, but I didn't know that was his father that particular time. And I know, he, I know you're proud of him. I know you're proud of him. God bless. In our uh, responsive reading, we read, Psalm 150, and I'd like for us to stand, I'd like, I'd like for us to stand, they can't hear me, nothing on. Are we to, okay, we're together? Okay, all right, I think, I think we're in good shape now. Uh, let's just read Psalm 150 uh, from our bulletin, and it's a psalm of praise. Let us again read that together. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And let's say that one more time. Praise the Lord. God bless. You may be seated. A call to praise. A call to praise. And this 150th Psalm, possibly maybe next to the 23rd and the 27th Psalm are uh, most likely the most quoted, the most remembered, uh, the Psalms that possibly touch our hearts, touch our lives, and uh, that give voice to our souls and to the spirit that is within us. This Psalm it tells us that God is to be worshipped. Amen? And not only is God to be worshipped, but we were created to worship God. Now, I know man has distorted God's design, and the third chapter of Genesis uh, points up the fact how man has, start, has entered in with his own disobedience and his arrogant spirit. But God created man to what? To worship him and him alone. Uh, but there's a problem. There's a problem. Since the fall of mankind, men have ceased to worship the true and living God. And instead, like men of old, man today as well as yesterday, we have substituted all kinds of gods. For instance, money, power, prestige, fame, fortune, control. People worship people, and they even have themselves as God. Now the question is this, why is it that so many people are hard, they are cold, they are loveless, fearful, they are introverted, sad, scared, 
empty, angry, violent, cunning, cunning rather, self-centered, and self-consumed. And the answer is that they have never really worshipped God. They have never bowed to God. They have never submitted their lives to him. They have never seen him in his glory. They have not experienced God's love. They have never made joyful noises and shouts before him. And as I was listening to Pastors Gray, uh, David and Robert, and especially to Pastor David Gray, when he was talking about how close he came to death, there are many times in our lives, all of us, we don't, we don't, we don't deliberately do this. I think it's an unconscious thing that we just take for granted the scheme of life, the schedule of life from day to day, and, and things, you know, basically go the same all the time. So we don't think about it. We just assume that today things are going to go the same way tomorrow. Maybe a few interruptions, uh, but beyond that, our lives are going to continue until there is a disruption. And all of a sudden, we realize how tenuous life is, how delicate life is, how short life is, how, how, uh, uh, how can, what, what other word am I looking for? Uh, uh, how scary life can be. Yeah, right, how delicate life can be. That basically our lives can end in a moment. And, 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 and I realize that in our youth, you feels as though that it's invulnerable. You remember when you were young, you felt as though that you could do anything and that you're going to live a long time and, and that we would look upon people 56 and 70, those are old folk, you know. But now we look up like batting an eyelid, and who's old now? We're the old folk. And the young folk are looking at us, and they, 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 they may not disrespect you and tell you, but they're laughing at themselves. Oh, they're old, you know, they're fading out. But as old saying goes, hang around here a few days. Just hang around a few days. Persons who have never learned to worship God, to praise him, they have never stayed in the presence of the almighty God, and they have never received this power. As the time of history grows near, the battle lines will be drawn. And we will either worship the living God or we will worship the devil with all of his masks and his disguises. Amen? Now, let, 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 let's get into this 150th Psalm. Are you ready? Uh, I, I hate to use this vernacular. Are you ready, Teddy? Are you ready, Pleasant Green? All right, let's go. In the 150th Psalm, the psalmist ends with a call to praise. The word praise is repeated 13 times in these short six verses. This psalm is an introduction. It is a summary of what real worship is expressing and is expressing joyful delight in the presence of God. Like the old folk used to say, it's just good uh, to be here. Amen? Now, the psalmist in this last psalm, he moves his thought from what to do before God, why to do it in verse 1, to, uh, forgive me, let me go back. What to do before God, where to do it in verse 1, then why to do it in verse 2, and then he concludes with how to do it in verses 3 through 6. Let's start out with the what and the where in verse 1. Verse 1 opens with the exaltation what? Praise ye the Lord. Repeat that after me. Praise ye the Lord. And this is written in the plural in Hebrew, which means it is addressed to all of us. And it answers the question 
of what we are to do when we come into the presence of our mighty God and our mighty King. We come what? Offering him what? Our cries, our shouts of glory to his name. For as the song says, only he is what? Worthy to be praised. Even though men praise one another, but in actuality, God is the only one that's worthy to be praised. How are we to come to God? We are to come expressing what? Love, devotion, delight, adoration. Now, where are we to express this? I'm glad you asked that question. First of all, we are to express this in his sanctuary. The Jews in the Old Testament, they had the tabernacle. Then after the tabernacle, which was a portable thing, then came the temple. But in A.D. 70, God in his judgment destroyed the temple. Now, since then, we in the New Testament and post-era, like, like uh, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, he says we are what? The temple of God. The Holy Spirit, what? Resides in you and me. When we were converted, when we accepted by faith Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came into our lives, what? Not temporarily, not to visit us, not to make a Thanksgiving circuit, but what? To live in us always and to be a part of us, to guide us, to teach us, to give us wisdom, to give us understanding. So we are the temple of God. We are the living temple of God. We are the body of Christ, and we minister together, not only in the sanctuary, but we are to worship God in his mighty firmament. What is a firmament? The firmament is the heaven and the earth. The, the psalmist says they join together and become one in praising him. How many of you have ever read the fifth chapter of Revelation? Raise your hand. Isn't that a beautiful chapter? That is one of the greatest chapters of praise, adoration, love that you can find in the Bible. Let, let, let me just briefly just give a synopsis of that fifth chapter of Revelation. In that fifth chapter of Revelation, the question, so to speak, theoretically is asked, there is a scroll, and the scroll has seven seals. And the question is asked, who is worthy? Who deserves the credit? Who is good enough? Who is pure enough to break these seals? And we are told that heaven is searched, earth is searched, beneath the earth is searched. And then finally, John says that so, uh, one of the messengers comes to, come to him and tells him, don't cry. We have found one that is worthy. He is the Lamb of God, and he is under the altar, slain from the foundations of the world. Okay, then the Lamb comes forward while God the Father is sitting on the throne, and the Lamb walks up to God takes the scroll from his hand, breaks the seals that are sealing the scroll, and then all of a sudden, there is hilarious, thunderous applause and singing that comes out of heaven. Angels, thousands and millions and billions of angels, the four living creatures, the four and twenty elders, all of them are bowing down and they're saying, holy, holy. In fact, John says they're singing a new song in that fifth chapter of Revelation. Now, we don't know what that new song is, but I'll tell you one thing. When I get to glory, I'm going to find out what that new song is. And I'm going to be with the saints singing that new song. And they are saying at the end of the fifth chapter of Revelation, they are saying glory, honor, majesty, power is given to the king. And then they said, and then they said to him, praise be to him. And then the fifth chapter is with by with the acclamation, 
Amen? Amen. Amen. Which means that heaven is echoing. They are validating what has been done. They are saying, so be it. Yes, this is right. And if heaven has enough sense, to praise Jesus Christ up there and all he's done down here for us. And we walk around arrogant, stiff-necked like a giraffe, thinking that we have done everything on our own until we come to that tiny thread where we lose our lives. And then we realize, I ain't here because I'm in control of my life. I'm here because of God, his mercy, and his grace. Amen. Oh, amen. And amen. Now, the second thing here in verse 2, the psalmist says, what should be our motive? What should be our reason for praising him? Let's put it in our present modern context now. Why are we here? to praise God. Are we here because we just came to see who's going to show up? We came to find out the latest gossip about the church. We came to hear about the negative reports. We came to see what, uh, how the choir is going to sing or uh, if the deacons are going to give a fiery devotion. Why are we here? Let's bring it home and make it personal and ask Let's each of us ask ourselves this question silently. Why am I here this morning? Have you ever asked yourself that question when you come into the sanctuary? Have you ever asked yourself, well, Lord, what has prompted me to get up this morning, to eat my breakfast, drink my coffee, put on my clothes, drive out here without any incident? Why do I go through all of this? Is it because of tradition? Is it because of habit? Is it because my parents were here? I was baptized here? Those things are all right, but that should not be the right motive. No, no. The right motive is I'm coming because of what God has done in my life a whole week. He let me live from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. He has blessed me with blessings that I didn't know was coming. He has kept away danger, death, and darkness and evil that he should have allowed to destroy me. But he said, no, I'm going to give them a chance to live a couple of days longer. I know they made mistakes, but I'm going to give them a chance by my grace. And the reason why I'm going to do it is because I love them. That should be our motive. We praise him for what? His mighty acts. And we do this because we are remembering the great things God has done in creation and history. Now let me ask this question. What has he done in your life? What has he done? Let's say in the last week, have you done any remembering in the past? Or maybe let's go back a little bit further, the last couple of months. Or maybe last year in 013 or maybe 012. Are you remembering maybe if you had a spell of illness and you were not too certain whether you were going to bounce back and get back on your feet? Or you had a spell of financial disaster and you didn't know in terms of how it was going to work out. Whatever it might have been, just remember, just for a moment. And in this remembering, do you remember that there might have been maybe glimpses or, fleeting, uh, or fleeing thoughts that maybe I may not make it? Or the enemy tried to plant in your mind destructive thoughts of saying that maybe God doesn't care or he doesn't hear your prayer or your prayers like the uh, old uh, saying goes is going up to the ceiling and coming back down but it has not gone to the throne. You gave up maybe psychologically, maybe mentally, 
Maybe spiritually you got a little bit weak, like David said in Psalm 51, restore unto me the joy, but then God reawakened your hope. He boosted your joy, and you realize, you know what? If it had not been for the Lord, I may not have been here today. Or if I had been here physically, I had given up. If it hadn't been for the Lord, I wouldn't be where I am now. In fact, look at so many people, babies that are dying as infants. In fact, let's go back. How many, we are told in terms of number, how many fetuses are destroyed, don't get a chance to even come to life? Amen? Say amen! We can't take life for granted. We could have been one of those fetuses that was aborted. Amen. And even if we got to maybe to breathe our first breath, and we got to maybe what? Uh, uh, we got to adolescence. Still there were trials. There were dangers. There were pitfalls. God carried us through our teen years. He carried us through our young adult years. And look at us now. We never would have thought we would have made it. In fact, you know what? My father died, and I'm going on because this is a short message. I'm going on. But you know what? My father was taken away from here at the age of 52. And for some reason, there was implanted in my thinking psychologically that I'm going to die about the same age of my father. So I called myself in my life trying to accomplish everything that I thought the Lord wanted me to do. Because when I hit my 40s, I started thinking I ain't got but 12 more years. So I got to get this done. When I reach 49, I got to get this done. I reach 50, I ain't got but two more years left. Daddy died in 52. 51 came. 52 came. 53 came. 54 came. And my wife said, you've forgotten something. And I said, what? You've forgotten that you live past your daddy's age. And I said, you know what? And it kept, and the years kept on rolling by, 55, 56, 60, 65. And that's as far as I'm going. I ain't going no further. <laughs> I ain't going no further. But you get my point, don't you? You get my point. I never would have dreamed that God would have let me live this year. And don't, and, and, and don't give me that, that, uh, that, how can I say it, that weak theory that ain't Helen or uh, ain't Maggie, they live to be 95 and 100. There are long livers in my family, so therefore that longevity ha is in the genes and it's been passed down to me. Now, 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 now. It could be passed over you. You know what I'm saying? Ain't no guarantee you're going to live as long as Aunt Maggie and, and whatever the lady's name is, your grandma, your, your, your father and mother. It's by the grace of God that we're yet alive. Did you not know that the acts of God reveal the character of God? In the 103rd Psalm, we are told that Israel, God's people, the only thing that really awakened their faith, the only thing that really caught their eye was what God did, opening the Red Sea, giving them manna in the wilderness, crossing the Jordan, fighting their enemies. When they saw God do something, they were impressed, and they said to God, be praised. But when they didn't see God do anything, then they, weren't, they were not too certain about whether God was with them. But the, the psalmist says, he revealed what he did to them, but to Moses he revealed himself. Now which would you rather have? God to bless you or the God that gives the blessing? A toy can be broken, 
but give me the manufacturer that makes the toys. And I can always get another toy. Say amen. We learn of the majesty of God in Genesis 1-1, where it says, in the beginning God created what? The heavens and the earth. We learn of the awesomeness of God, the righteousness of God, the justice of God. We see him dealing with his people and with the Egyptian little gods in Egypt where he destroyed them with his plague. We see the love of God, the mercy of God, the covenant treaty with his people. And he shows his faithfulness to all of us, which is consummated in his new covenant in the blood of what? Jesus Christ. For Jesus said in the upper room, just before Calvary, he said, boys, and this is my, this is my paraphrase, and I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not trying, not trying to degrade the scripture. But boys, I'm breaking the bread for you to eat. But I'm giving you what? Some wine. And this wine symbolizes my blood. Now, I'm not going to drink any wine with you. I want you to drink the wine. The only time I'm going to drink this wine, what? It's when we drink it together in my Father's kingdom. Don't you know that's going to be a day when all of God's children, we're going to be around his banquet table, and I ain't never seen no banquet table big enough to accommodate all of God's children. But he said it, I believe it, and I know it's going to come to pass. Aren't you glad that you're going to be sitting around that banquet table? Aren't you glad that you're going to be one of the saved and you're not going to be in darkness, separated from his love? And not because of what we did, but because of what he did. Did he have to do it? He so did not have to do it. We must remember the mighty acts of God in our own lives. We are to praise him for his what? Excellent greatness. God is great. He's full of greatness. No one is greater than God. So therefore we praise him for who he is, not just for what he does. He's a mighty king. He's an eternal God. He's a source of all things. All things come from him. All things return to him. All things end in him. He's filled with holiness, justice, trustworthiness, covenant love. He's alpha. He's omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. All of our motives for praise are twofold. We praise him for who he is, and we praise him for what he's done. And make certain that we keep the priority right. Not for what he's done first and then who he is, but for who he is and what he's done. He is, he did, <laughs> let, can I break some English? Because I do it all the time anyway. What he done done, he done did it because of who he is. It's just that simple. And you don't need a theologian to uh, interpret that. We ought to praise him for his excellence. But now, the psalmist says in verses 3 to 6, finally, how are we to praise his name? The psalmist here describes the ancient musical instruments of Israel. And first of all, he says we are to praise him with what? Sound of the trumpet. This goes back to the Old Testament, to the ram's horn that was used when the Israelites got ready to fight, and it was used for signaling in battle. He said we praise him with the lute. This was a string instrument. It had a sound chamber in it. And all of this I looked up now. <laughs> We praise him with the harp. We praise him with the timbre, which I found out it's a woman's instrument that's used in dancing. We praise him, the psalmist says, with stringed instruments, with flutes, live cymbals, clashing cymbals, all types of percussion instruments, which means the psalmist is saying, God is to be praised by what? A symphony 
of sound. How many of you have ever been to a concert where there was a full orchestra that played? Raise your hand. All right. In that orchestra, how many roughly instruments do you think that they had, that you saw? They had violins, what? They had, they had flutes, trumpets, trombones, bass horns, violins, drums, uh, cymbals. You go on and yeah, maybe about, I don't know, maybe about 15 types of instruments. Now, if you notice, none of those instruments were louder than the other instruments. Are you with me? Now, if you, if you don't walk with me, you're going to miss this. If any one of those instruments was not in sync with the other instruments, maybe an untrained ear could not detect it. But one that was trained could tell that there was a pitch, that the orchestra was not together, that the music was not flowing beautifully. And then also you notice this. In the piece of music that the orchestra was playing, each instrument had a part. Oh, you don't hear me. Some of you just looking at me, and you ain't saying nothing, and you ought to be glad that God brought you here this morning. The violins have a piece that has been written into the music. The trumpets have a piece. The drums have a piece. Every instrument has a piece, but even though they have a piece to play in that piece of music, when they are brought together, oh, what a sound it makes. Beautiful harmony. When the choir, the pulpit, the deacons, the ushers, the uh, every member who's a part of the fold, the nurses unit, the mothers, when all of us get together and all of us are praying for one thing and all of us are looking for God to be in our midst, what happens? There is beautiful, what? Spiritual music that comes out of a service of praise. Well, just about through, I guess some of you are saying good riddance. The issue is not what instruments we use, but why do we use them and how we use them. Even the liturgical dance is good, and you know we have liturgical dancers. But if the dance comes from the heart, beautiful. If it is spirit-led, beautiful. If it is not for a show or theatrics, beautiful. And it has to be appropriate to the service. But if it is contentious, if it is for show, if it is to entertain, God is not in that. Amen? Singing can be for entertainment. Preaching can be for entertainment. Praying can be for entertainment. Service can be for entertainment. But something we got to remember is this. In the New Testament, it says, we're not to please men. Say amen. We're not to give a show to other folks. Our responsibility of what? It's to please the almighty God who gives us breath, who allows us to live. Finally, his exaltation in verse 6 refers back to verse 1. And he says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Can you repeat that with me? Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Now, say the word breath. And say it like this, breath. Like you blowing out air. You're exhaling air. Say it again. Let everything that have what? Breath praise the Lord. Now, now, now. And I'm, I'm, I'm just a few, few more sentences, y'all. I'll be through. When you said that, was it a machine in you that said it?
how were you able to say it? You said it with breath. I wish I could get out of this wheelchair. God of man, I wish I could do it. I want to see some of you all. You said it with breath. Your lungs pumped out through your vocal cords. And you said, let, when you said, let everything have breath, the lungs rejoiced and said, yes. And the vocal cords vibrated and said, yes, everything. Animals have breath. Birds have breath. Fishes have breath. Man has breath. Everything. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got to, got to, ah, got to. I can't hoop the way I want to sitting in that chair. He says that everything that have breath, praise the Lord. Now, if you ain't able to voice a shout or a cry, that's your problem. But it does imply that there is an ungrateful spirit. There's a spirit that's not thankful to him. But let me tell you, if you're not thankful, the day will come in your life that you're going to thank God. And you're going to be glad that God looked over your stupidity, that he looked over your arrogance, that he looked over your pride, and that he just in his mercy, he said, I'm going to give him just a few more days, a few more hours, a few more seconds. And he said, I'm going to let them roll on a little while longer. Now, I know, and Satan possibly, like in the book of Job, when God and Satan were having a conversation, Satan possibly was saying to the Lord about you and me, they don't deserve it. Look at all the mistakes they have made. Look how silly they have been. Look how they have hurt other people in what they have said. But Grace said, no, no. No, no. Give them another chance. No. Give them another chance. Bonner don't deserve it. But he sure does need it. Oh. Oh, Lord, have mercy. It's all in my bones. Let everything, everything, everybody stand on your feet and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. watching over me at night, allowing me to wake up in the morning, sending your angels to watch over me all oh, night long. Uh, Dominique, come on up. I want Dominique to sing the um, invitational song. But, but, but let me end with this. How many of us are thankful this morning? Somebody said it was grace that woke me up. 
grace started me on my way. And you know, there are many times that the violence that has broken out in our community, and all of you have been keeping abreast with the news coverage, and they're expecting a violent outbreak uh, when the decision comes down about this police officer. And they are assuming that, uh, that there will not be any kind of um, sentence given him. So they are looking for an explosion in our city, violence, rioting, burning, looting. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know this, and I want us to be reminded of this fact. God is still in control. Do you know what I said? God uh, is in charge. And what we see ain't what we see. And don't you think that God is going to sleep and taking himself a brief nap? God sees everything. And uh, we know that Satan is the dark forces behind this. We understand that. But we also know this. One Friday, on a hill called Calvary, darkness was banished. Evil forces tried to subdue your Lord and my Savior. But you remember the cry, the battle cry that he gave at the end? He looked up to heaven, and I'm sure he looked into the eyes of his father. And I don't know, I wasn't there, but I'm sure there was a smile in his heart when he said, Father, it's finished. He wasn't talking about his death. He wasn't talking about his physical breath. But he was talking about the plan that his father had executed and put into place that would, re, that would result in him, that would be climax in his blood, that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's finished. It's finished. And when the Holy Spirit came into your heart and my heart, when we by faith accepted Jesus, it's finished. There's nothing else that has to be done. You don't need to be resaved again. You can't lose your salvation and then run it down and catch it later on. That's the dumbest stuff I've ever heard of in my life. When you are saved, if you can lose your salvation, what does that say about the God who gave you your salvation? Whosoever will, let him come. Let us stand. The door of the kingdom is open, not the doors of the church, but the door of the kingdom is open. Whosoever will, let them come. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
yeah. So I know he was there for me. Yeah. I sing. 